Hello everyone, it's uh, Women's Football Today and it's our talk back show where we give you the opportunity to ask us questions and to talk about whatever you want to do, talk about that's related to women's football. And I'm joined, I'm very honoured today to be joined by Carly Osborne, who is uh, the Brentford women's coach. How are you doing, Carly? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good, very good indeed. And, you know, I was uh, jealous to find that you were playing football today. How, how was your game? Yeah, it well, wasn't the best of starts back our first game. We lost 3-0, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, got rid of some of the rustiness and um, just looking forward to get back on the training pitch and obviously preparing for next weekend. Yeah, games are game. The way I look at it at my age, a game is a game. A game of football <laughs> is something to look forward to. And win, lose or draw, it's you know it's still that taking part. You want to win, but it's still the taking part. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, the show, so I'll let you know, the show is about you guys out there asking us questions. Now, we've had a lot of people... Contact us, uh, contact us already and uh, they'll be coming on air in the next, let's say, 40, 45 minutes. And we've had a few people send in their video questions as well. So I say a big thanks to them for doing that and we'll air their questions in a few minutes. Obviously, it's been a, a massive day of FA Cup action, FA Cup third round action today. Lots of um, women's National League clubs playing. What I'm going to do to start with is go... Uh, through the scores of the games uh, today, go through the results. Hopefully, we'll have uh, a, a manager coming on. But it's one of those hit and miss things, you know. Obviously, uh, he, his team's playing away, so they've got to get <laughs> get on the coach and everything else. So we'll, we'll hope for that. Let me just hopefully pick up the right screen here. We'll go through the um, remove. Uh, sorry, I'm going to remove you for a second, Carly. Um, but he's a, here are the third round results. We had Burnley nil, Sunderland nil. Burnley won on penalties. Cheltenham Town one, Gillingham two, Huddersfield Town one, Brigheis one, and Huddersfield won on penalties. With Leighton Orient one, Chichester and Selsey two, Middlesbrough four, Wem Town nil, Oxford United three, Billericay Town nil. Southampton, three. Yeovil United, nil. West Bromwich, Albion, one. Derby County, four. And I'm just going to move this so we can see the last one. Watford, one. And Wolverhampton Wanderers, four. So well done to all the teams that have got through. And commiserations to those teams that didn't make it. So we'll just wait for our first caller to go on um, to ask us a question. Hopefully in the next minute or two. So I might as well start, Carly, because I think people would like to know a little bit about you. Obviously, you're an expert. But what, what's your um, women's football management journey been like? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I played the career for 17, 17 years. Um, so kind of it's everything I've known. I was fortunate enough to have a good career, play kind of championship level um, down make over 350 appearances within the league and things like that. And and obviously, was fortunate enough to win a few promotions and stuff. So I, I was lucky to have a have a good career. But um, my, my coaching journey kind of started sort of three years ago um, or a little bit before that when um, one of my good friends was, was manager at Brentford Women's and I've got a long affiliation with Brentford because I played with them f uh, for nine years and came through the youth team there. So um, he asked me to come in and help him out. Um, and I did. I didn't really have any expectations at the time. Um, and I, I, did, I didn't really know kind of, I didn't know loads about women's football, if I'm honest. Um, but I knew I wanted to do some coaching and I wanted to kind of, of help him as well. So it worked, it worked really well for me. Um, but once I got in, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, the, the, the girls are fantastic. Um, they want to learn, they listen, they want to, they want to improve. Um, and that kind of sparked my interest in the women's side of the game. Um, from there, I, I kind of um, I moved away because I was still playing at the time. So I moved away, um, didn't do it anymore. But when I came back, um, I spoke to um, Amy Roger at the club, who are, who are owners of the club, and they um, they wanted me to come in and, and kind of take on the head coach role, which was a real honour. Um, we've set ourselves some really big targets and goals that we want to hit over the next few seasons, especially. Um, but originally when I came in, it was kind of to oversee the first team and the development. And um, try and kind of set the the um, the standards a bit higher, and also obviously improve the players um, so that we can start challenging and, and winning promotions to move up the leagues. Um, 
after a while, what I did was I ended up just taking the first team role um, and have focused a lot more on obviously pushing the first team on, improving our players and, and moving the club forward um, as a whole. And, we, you know, we want to, our next aim is to get into step six. Um, once we're in step six, we want to push on again and, and try and get into the Women's National League as quick as possible. OK, I'm going to bring in our first guest. Um, I'm going to say massive thanks to Scott for coming on today. I'm going to bring Scott in, put him up nice and big. Scott, uh, Billerick uh, Town Women's Manager, sadly, FA Cup, uh, if I might, you lost today, Scott. Yeah, we did, unfortunately. He, uh, yeah, do, do you want to tell us a little bit about the game and, um, and how, how you two actually played? We played Oxford United, very good team. We're in the FA National League of their the league club. Uh, so we was on the back of uh, a very good win last week, beating Ipswich Town. They were obviously a fantastic side. And today, we just never got going, really, if I'm honest. Not, not to take that away from Oxford, fantastic team, great set, uh, very good hosts as well. But unfortunately, we just didn't get going and we ended up losing the game 3-1. Uh, was it three one game? Probably not. Did we deserve to lose? Probably yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, I guess it's, there's a mix of emotions. Obviously, it's great to be back playing football, uh, and but it's gutting to be knocked out. And you, te you know, the girls will probably, I expect, train really hard over the last uh, couple of weeks uh, since they've been allowed to. Um, do all that. Training and, and, and the game itself, does that hold me in good stead for what to come in the future? Can you take take the loss and actually um, come back stronger? Yeah, look, of, of course we can. It wasn't so we had we come back, we had two training sessions and then that play against Ipswich, which was last Sunday. And obviously, Ipswich have got a lot of academy players in their team, so those classes are little, they actually trained right through, so that was tough. Yeah. And then we had two training sessions and then come. The Oxford game. It was in the same boat, to be fair. They had minimal sessions. Was it ideal preparation? No, it wasn't. But as they say, the show has to go on. The fixtures had to be played. The FA Cup we didn't play that because we didn't fall too far behind with it. So we will take that out of today's game. It's shown us the level, what's above us. Is obviously that's the aim that we want to get to. We want to try and get out of the league that we're currently in. Oxford are in the league above, so that was a good idea of the level. But Oxford are, I think they was before lockdown, second in the league with a game in hand and they won that to go top. So we was actually playing probably one of the teams in that league. That was a real eye opener for it. And if anything, like what you said, that, that, that game has got of encouragement. Like we, we wasn't far off. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're going to take out. We're going to go and work hard. We've got quite a few friends planned. Just get the training sessions in, get a pre season done, and hopefully. Like obviously the, the other guests you've got on there, hopefully we can get through an uninterrupted season <laughs> because it's this one's been hit and miss stuff. <laughs> it's not just for the players, it's hard on the players, but it's hard for the coaches and managers as well because you put so much plan and preparation in stuff, and suddenly it stops, and then you feel like you've got to go back and start again. So we had sort of mini pre-season as such because yeah. the games fast and. But look, if you're honest, I wouldn't have it any other way because it's all sound that desperate we was to get back. So I'm not now going to sit here and say, oh, we had, because we all, we've done the last two weeks what we all want to do, which is play football. And I hope that we can have consistency within the game and just hopefully get a good pre in the season, uh, a full run for everyone. Yeah. So finally, uh, Scott, what's left um, for Bolivia Town this season? Are, are you going to carry on training as long as you can? Yeah, we're going to carry on training. I've spoke with the girls and I've said something to myself. We will have a little a slight break, but obviously it's a difficult one because we've had such a long layoff and then you feel like we've trained, get them to a certain fit level and then to have another break because some of the, the players, obviously they've all got full-time jobs. So yeah. the football training is their own, only source of fitness for some of them. But we're going to go through as, as much as we can. And uh, yeah, we're probably going to try and go right through. We've got loads of friendlies playing. And it's similar to what your, your previous caller was saying, that the level of women's football now is so good. So good. And uh, you see some of these these silly videos like floating around on Twitter, what people put in, you know, disregarding the game, which is, is total nonsense. Would it do that? Obviously, I've never watched it. I've never been like, like involved in coaching 
coaching in the women's game and the level's getting better and I think it's only going to get better. Like I said, we've got a lot of, a lot of male coaches like myself and the other guests here. I worked at Tottenham for 12 years, worked at Cooper for six years, never thought about coaching women's game. Nah, I would never think about leaving. I love it. I've got most, most coaches are the same. They're very coachable. I hope that now with, with the funding that's going into the top level, that can start filtering down and, and really give women's football Oh, shit. I've got to say a massive thanks, Scott, for coming on tonight. Obviously disappointing to be knocked out of the FA Cup. But best of luck for next season. Brilliant. Thanks for having me on. Cheers, mate. Nice Cheers. Bye. Bye. There we go. That's uh, Scott. And we're going to bring in Jude. You might remember Jude. She was our guest host last week. Jude, how are you doing? Hi. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Not so bad, not so bad. Um... Jude, what's your question for us, please? Yes, yeah, so uh, just looking back at the Lionesses game, uh, the, the England, well, the France England game on Friday night. Um, and I suppose it's a, a two two prong question, really. Uh, looking forward to Team GB in the Olympics in in the yeah. summer. Um, do you think that there was any players that have pretty much sealed their their ticket on the plane to Tokyo, based on the performance on? Uh, Friday night um, and also do you think there's anything that fundamentally needs to change um, certainly before the Canada game this week but also looking ahead towards the Olympics and, and building towards the Euros next year as well Okay uh, let's get to, Do you want to answer that Carly or do you want me to take it? Yeah I mean I'll, I'll add a little bit um, I, I don't I think I don't think anyone's kind of submitted their place yet. I think they'll try to um, keep everyone almost guessing and, and, and as competitive as, as possible. Um, I saw I saw a really good clip of I don't know if you've seen it of Nikita Paris, um, and she was kind of delivering a real um, inspirational speech after the game and um, and how kind of the, the standards they've set they can't drop below them and, and how much it means to them all. Um, and I think it's good that you know they're. The, the women's game is is growing so fast and the quality within the game is fantastic um, and I think it's important that they, they keep it competitive and when they enter these big uh, competitions they're they're a real threat for everyone so I don't I don't think anyone will feel will feel yet that they've cemented their place um, and I, I think I think that's a good thing it just keeps everyone working hard and and also keeps England at the you know at the very best of their ability as well because everyone's kind of focused on that and I think that's the way it kind of should be. Yeah, I'm going to pop in, put myself in, put Carly on mute for a second. Um, is it an, if I'm right, is it an 18 man squad for Jude? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's eight, it's 18, and then is it three or four is it an 18 reserve? Squad? Yeah, yeah, 18 player squad. Um, okay, I, I I've got a suspicion that a couple of players that didn't play against France. Um, have cemented their place. Um, I think you, you 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 can't have a Team GB squad without Lucy Bronze and Steph Horton. Um, so I think they'll be there, and probably a few others. The if they're not got one the uh, two feet in, they've got one foot in. Um, you know, I, I think as you'd expect, the bulk of the squad will be English players. Um, but I, I, I think we saw. I mean, we saw some really good performances from. Uh, some players, I think Nikki Paris played well. Uh, look, we saw the what Lauren Hemp did in about what was it, eighteen or twenty minutes or whatever she was on, and everybody's now screaming that she should start uh, the next game because uh, she dazzled and she she was the main uh, creator of mayhem for the defence of, of France. Uh, Chloe Kelly had a reasonable game. I'm not just mentioning Man City players; it just you know they 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 <laughs> or ex Man City players. They just happened to you know. It's, what they did stayed, uh, stayed in my mind. Um, and the second part of your question, can we actually do much fundamentally different for the game against Canada? Um, I think it partly will depend on, on the players, um, you know, the one or two players. It, uh, uh, will they be looking to, for, for example, start Lauren Hemp, um, start Chloe Kelly, start, you know, some of the players who are on the bench? Um, I would expect them not to change too much in, in terms of the system. 
if, if the coach wants that system to be going going forwards and maybe change a little, little bit of the personnel and uh, as uh, as well i don't think you know that you can have too many players playing the full 90 twice in the space of four days so it'll be interesting to see how they change the personnel around um and it was from from my point of view it was a little bit disappointing because that was most of england's best squad and arguably you know a lot of the french players were you could argue were part of their b team um a few of them were because obviously they were of covid and some players couldn't play so just from that point of view from Eng from england lioness's point of view it was disappointing uh, that france actually looked far strong um, if, if i can say this far stronger than england and they looked a lot more dangerous um for for, for longer periods in the game uh, than england did um and speaking to people on um after the game on Friday, you know, England are going to have to change things up. They haven't got long left. They have to beat teams like France uh, if they want to win tournaments. And that's the next step. You know, getting to semi-finals is, uh, it's all right, I, I think. But I think England uh, and, and the fans and the uh, players and the management team, they want to take that next step. You know, we want to get to the finals of tournaments and actually win them. So we're going to have to step up. Um I'm, I'm certainly no coach and uh, tactician to say how we're going to do that, but um, we, we certainly got the players. We, we've got the ability to do that. We're just going to have to, hopefully, with the, the new manager, uh, hopefully she's, she's got enough time to make that difference. How's that, Judy? Is that okay? Can you get in, yeah, in yeah. It's, I mean, it's a tough one, isn't it? Obviously, only 18 players can make the squad and then, and then the reserve list. Um, and... You know, I think if you look at players like Caroline Weir, uh, maybe Erin Cuthbert, yeah. um, you know, if they if they don't make the squad, I'd be I'd be disappointed if they don't make the squad. And I'm a Manchester City fan, so um, but you know, you look you look wider for for the for the for the country. Um, I I was a bit disappointed with the performance um, on Friday, especially with the with the back line. Um, but obviously, Lucy was out, Demi was out, Steph was out. Um, but for, for me, it's trying to build that centre-back partnership. Um, and I think that that's where we struggled a bit on, on Friday um, with, with Millie Bright and, and Leah Williamson. And individually, they are both really good players as well. They're, they're very good players for their clubs. Um, so it's and it's and we also need to think about, you know, hopefully Steph's injury will be, will be should be fully recovered and, and should be back up and running. Um, but obviously we need to be mindful of that. Um, you know, Lucy's injured as well. So, you know, will we see Lucy at all or, or Demi um, against Canada in the week? I, I don't know. Um, but it, but it's certainly looking at trying to build that that centre centre back partnership. And I, I think since the World Cup, England have struggled. Um, and um, you know, and defend and we seem to have struggled defensively as well. Um, and, and we just need to be a bit more clinical. You know, we've got some really good players and it's it's just about gelling it together. Obviously, Heger Reese has got only a very limited time to, to do that um, before Serena Wiegmann comes in in September. But, you know, we'll we'll, we'll think positive and, and hopefully it'll be a, a better performance against Canada. Because like you said, Ray, it was it was pretty much the, the B team for France. Um, and France are third in the world, I think, still. Yeah. Um, England has sort of slipped down the rankings following following the World Cup. Um, and when you look at the Olympics, I, I can't remember the full squad, um, the full list of countries, but obviously the USA are going to be there. Um, I think Canada qualified as well. Um, and then from Europe, it's Sweden and the Netherlands because it was the top three clubs, uh, top three countries in Europe um, for, in the World Cup. So, and, you know, Sweden beat us convincingly. Um, at the World Cup, and and I think they beat us in, in a friendly afterwards as well. So, you know, yeah, obviously there's a lot of expectation now because of the game growing so much in this country. Um, you know, hopefully we can we can go out in, into Tokyo and uh, and put on a really good performance. Yeah. All right. Thanks you so much for joining us, Jude, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Uh, we're going to bring in Stevie. Let's bring in Stevie. How are you doing, Stevie? How are you good, doing? Thank you. Hi, Ray. Hi, Carly. Um, my question is um, for Carly, really, with regards to the best mate in the WSL in the championship. Uh, obviously, it's great for the women's game in general, 
But how do you think that's going to impact your team and your league? That's for you, Carly. Uh, sorry, how is this? Me okay? Uh, you're right. Is me fully there? What was the question? Sorry. So just with guys like the um the, the Sky and BBC. Yeah, good. Um, thank you. The, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. The investment was that? Uh, yeah, the investment, yeah. yeah. So, the, like, so obviously, that the exposure um, and investment, yeah. How do you see it affecting? Obviously, for the women's yeah. game in general, it, it's great, but how will it affect you or your league? Uh, you know what? It's a funny question. I don't know. I mean, the investment's fantastic. It's, it's brilliant. It's what the women's game needs. It, it's, what, it's what the women's game needs. Um, but how that then filters down to kind of where we are, I mean... We're step seven at the moment, uh, trying to push into step six, is the bit that I, I, I'm kind of unsure of. Um, I think the, the slight issue at the moment is we, you know, we're really pushing hard to to raise the awareness of the WSL and, and the, the women's uh, championship and stuff like that, and rightly we should be. But sometimes I think the, the leagues below will end up missing out, and then what will happen is the gap between the top two leagues and all the other leagues will become huge. Um, and you'll never, and you won't be able to quite get the kind of standard for the players, if that makes sense. And those players who are striving to get into those top two leagues, there will always be such a gap between them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping it does filter down. I think I think it needs to, um, in terms of you know more facilities, uh, more for, more support in terms of you know the the things that, that clubs need. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of clubs are self-funded, aren't they? And it's it can be tough sometimes if. You know, if you don't, if you don't have, um, you know, the right backing or, or, or things like that. We, I mean, we're really lucky. Um, Brentford, are, Brentford are on board and are kind of pushing up. Oh, we've lost Carly. We've lost Carly. <laughs> Hopefully, he'll come back. Hopefully, Carly will come back. Uh, I think. We'll, <laughs> let's see if Carly comes back. I'm going to say thanks for your question, Stevie. Uh, if Carly comes, back, we might be able to nip back to it. Um, but I think we've lost him for for good. For, for the time being, hopefully he'll come back. <laughs> we'll move on to, let's just check if he's back. He's back. Carly's back. Carly, are you back? <laughs> Is he back? Is he back? The wonders of uh, live filming. <laughs> the joys of live streaming. <laughs> That's, it. That's it. He's spinning, he's spinning, he's spinning. Yeah. Let's pop him out until uh, he comes back. Because, yeah, thanks for your uh, question, Stephen. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. No problem. Thanks, Ray. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Let's drop Stevie out and let's bring in Jenny and hopefully Carly will be back. Let's bring Jenny and let's ask Jenny for a question. Jenny, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. Thank you, Jenny. What's your question for us tonight? Um, well, it's about Rose Lavelle. She looks so good for the USA team. Um, what is it that she can't get to start at City? Wow, Rose Lavelle, I'll bring you in. I'll bring Carly in and put at least Carly in the background. Um, I'll answer this because obviously, yeah, you're back now, Carly. Don't worry, mate. <laughs> um, I'll answer this because obviously it's it's my team and city, so I'll take this. Sorry, um, uh, no worries, man. It happens. It's live. It's live. So I'll I'll, I'll take the que this question. We'll bring you back in for the next. So yeah, look, it, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult, uh, Jenny. Whenever we see Rose Lavelle play for the US Women's National Team, she's a star for them. Um, and we always get a flurry of comments, mostly from uh, US fans. I don't know where that's coming from. Mostly from US fans to say that, you know, why isn't she playing uh, for City? What's wrong? What's wrong with the manager? You know, I've had this recently. Why is the manager picking him, picking her? You, well, you've got to look at it that. City have got a world-class midfield. I, I would suggest, you know, you've got Sam, Sam Mewis there, one of the best players in the world. You've got Caroline Weir, another top, top player. You've got um, Kira Walsh, another top player we saw play for England the other night against France, and she was one of the best English players on the pitch. So it's difficult to even break into that uh, City midfield. And the times that earlier in the season when Rose played, she, you could argue she was sometimes playing out of position up, uh, up out wide because Lauren Hemp was injured and she didn't really really do herself justice when she was playing for City. So naturally, as City have got better this season, that midfield three 
And that trio's played really well. We've got Laura Coombs, who's been in and out of the side as well. I think she's just been injured for a little while. So it's been very difficult for anybody to break into a side that's winning most games. You know, the, the games where we struggled recently have been in, against Barcelona and Chelsea. Those are the two teams that have put us under pressure, um, put us to the sword a little bit. But generally throughout the league uh, and FA Cup season and most of the Conti Cup, we, our midfield's been really, really strong. So it's difficult for us to, to get in. And when she plays, if she's coming off the bench, she's got to shine. She's really got to shine to prove that she should be starting uh, other games. Um, so I think that's really difficult. And, and what people don't appreciate is the coach, you know, Gary Taylor, the manager, he would see the players all the time, you know, in training sessions. And he's got to make a decision on, you know, obviously what he feels is best um, for the team. And, to, and against whoever the opponents are. And right now, Rose hasn't been uh, a starter. I, um, it, it's also one of these things, and sometimes it can take players a little while to adapt. You know, it's lots of things, new country, obviously COVID situation. I think she was either injured or she had to isolate when she came, so she didn't get the same level of uh, pre-season as, as some of the other players. Um, and that can just hold you back a little bit. And hopefully now she's firing. Fingers crossed she signs uh, a uh, contract extension. I think she's only here for a year. Same with Sam Uis. If they stay longer, um, then maybe it be next season that we really see her shining. Um, and I think I think we really do need to see her shining because Man City need to go to, to get to a, um, the next level to actually be able to challenge Chelsea, to be able to challenge, to challenge the Barcelonas of this world. We have to step up to the next level. And, you know, hopefully uh, Rose Lavelle playing... The way she plays for the United States for City, playing for City, I think that she will help us to get to that next level. Is that all right for, for you, Jenny? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Yes, Jenny. Thanks a lot for your Thank question. You. See you soon. I'm going to bring in Mar uh, Marie Claire. Um, I'm bringing Marie Claire to uh, talk a little bit about Scottish football. Let's pop you in there. And we're going to do some work with the, hopefully with Marie Claire, a podcast coming up shortly about women's uh, football in Scotland. So, Marie Claire, do you want to tell us a little bit, a little bit, rather than asking me a question, tell us a little bit about Scottish football and uh, how you're hoping to give it a little bit more airtime, a little bit, a little bit more um, prominence, um, so that people actually either watch it, talk about it, and, and don't forget it when this new TV deal comes in and, you know, the focus is going to be on uh, uh, Women's Super League, not to forget what's going on in Scotland. Good evening, um, Ray and Callie. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Um, it's lovely to to finally talk to you. Um, yeah, the, the idea that I have um, really came from my own daughter, um, Megan, who's 10, and she plays for Hamilton Academicals under 11 team. Um, I'm also at university and decided that my last year at uni was going to be about something really close to my heart. So I decided to write my final dissertation on um, social inequality within the, the women's game. Um, did a lot of historical stuff, really, really fascinating. Um, and from there, kind of came along. I was interviewing some professional um, players in Scotland, um, and they kinda were all telling me the same kind of story. Um, how it's quite difficult north of the border to get funding, various other things. So from there, kind of, it grew the interest. I've always loved football, followed men's football for years. And when my little one became more interested, I started following the, the women's game for quite a long time now. And it's been it's been an absolute joy to watch females um, playing football and actually technically becoming so gifted it's it's really wonderful to watch that um so yeah the kind of blog idea was contacting yourselves i've seen it on twitter the mm -hmm. magic of social media <laughs> and it kind of put a little bit of thought into it and thought Do you know i'd like to get involved with with yourselves and um, i've watched your blogs before and i've kind of not participated but maybe a wee bit too shy but tonight seems to be the night that i've decided to come on live um i'll cut it quite short as kind of fundamental things that I'm really looking to to raise the profile of Scottish teams um, kind of the youth players as well I'm looking at rising stars um, tomorrow night I'm actually being um, I'll, I've actually been invited to watch Glasgow ladies 
um, train and I'm going to be able to interview the manager tomorrow evening, um, all COVID sorted out and all that stuff. <laughs> um, and really interested in kind of raising the, the profile of young players. Um, my own daughter is a huge Man City supporter, from we live outside Glasgow. <laughs> um, and she's she's a huge Caroline Weir fan also. Um, so it's, you know, the young Caroline Weirs of yeah. the Scottish game would be fascinating to kind of give them a bit of a, a platform and, you know, being able to, to interview um, the younger players, obviously has to be over 18, but, you know, giving them a bit of a platform, which never seems to really happen here. Um, looking at grassroots football also, smaller clubs, recruitment, you know, some teams in Scotland, there's lots of girls' teams, but they can't seem to get the players. So that's a big issue. So something like that that we could maybe bring to the forefront as well um, to, to, to get more girls into the game, basically, um, which, is, which is brilliant. Looking at current clubs, um, looking at, you know, the Celtics and the Rangers and the Hibs, as we say up here, um, looking at bringing their profiles up more um, because everybody, you know, loves the, you know, the women's football um, down south. But up here, it's a bit of a different story. So, again, raising profiles and showing that we can play football here as well would be would be brilliant. Um, very interested in how to promote women's football, getting people in the door. Obviously, just now, there's no going to football, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but, you know, trying to... I mean, my local team is Celtic Football Club. Um, and I take my daughter there to watch football because she just loves to watch anybody. Um, but the attendance levels is terrible for quite a big club for the men. But for the women, you know, it's the attendance gate. You're lucky sometimes you get 50 people. And the majority of those people are actually the parents of the girls that play. So it's, it's a bit sad. Um, the lack of kind of fan participation. Where a lot of people tell you, oh, we are Celtic fan or we are Rangers fans, but they're not supporting the women's team. So I really want to bring that to the forefront to get the big clubs, as we would say here, you know, with very little participation um, from the fans. Um, and then another thing, I know I'm flinging a lot at you tonight. <laughs> I do apologise. Um, it's a kind of social policy. I'm really ready to take on our government here um, to really get funding for the girls there's a lot of funding for rugby here yeah. golf and boys football um but very little for women's football um you know our spl2 hasn't started yet and um, my daughter's club Ham hamilton academicals they are still in limbo at the moment to find out when they'll be able to play games so it's it's quite it's quite unfair um for some of the players um looking at sponsorship through the blog as well, you know, looking at small teams, how can they be sponsored? Um, you know, a lot of girls need to get football boot sponsorship. But you don't really hear that about the boys. So there's a lot of inequality that I really am. I'm a sociologist by nature. So inequality is quite a thing for me. And I'm really interested in tackling that as well. So I've got a big job ahead of me, but I'll have to break it down. But that's generally my thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I do admire your passion, uh, Mary Claire. You know, and, uh, taking on the government and and really trying to promote um, the women's game in Scotland, which is why what, one of the main reasons we we, we uh, want to work with you and to help you do that and provide use our platform uh, to push. Um, you know the. Uh, the knowledge of the women's game north of the border um and so you know obviously people become more aware that you know young girls don't have to look just to england uh for um the women's game i mean it's it's right there on their doorstep and the prospect of uh, some more caroline weirs coming through wow <laughs> if you can manage half a dozen of them scotland will be one of the top teams going because uh, she's a, a wonderful player can i just ask you a quick question then because hopefully the podcast will start within the next week or two. If we were will, uh, we'll talking about the Olympic the Team GB earlier on, how many Scottish players do you think deserve to be there or how many do you think will be there in that squad? I'd like to see two of them. I think Caroline Weir should be in, I think, for sure. 
Evan Cuthbert, she's yeah. banging in the goals for Chelsea ladies, so I can't see why not, but being a striker um, in the GB team would be extremely difficult for her to break into a field, but she's a very talented um, striker, Erin, and she's always willing to learn. Um, also, when she played for Glasgow City um, before her big move, and she was a phenomenal player there, but there's a wealth of talent down south also, yeah. so well, that's the problem, but there's probably um, you know, it's up here it's kind of good players in Scotland are big fish in a small pond Yeah, but down, down in England it's a, it's a very different story and there's a lot of good talent um, but I would like to see, I think those two girls getting a chance, I think they would, they would do very well in the squad Yeah, I think they, what might uh, favour them is the fact uh, um, of the teams they play for I mean, Erin's uh, playing for uh, Chelsea and there'll be a few Chelsea players in that squad. You've got people like uh, Fran Kirby, so she plays with her. So you've got that automatic link up. And same with Caroline Weir. You know, you'll have in the squad. I think you'll get Lauren Hem, probably, probably, or possibly Chloe Kelly, Kira Walsh. You know, so they, they they play together at Man City, and maybe you'll have someone like Lucy Bronson, Steph Orton uh, in the defence. So you've got that familiarity. You've got that knowing. Uh, and sometimes that telepathic uh, anticipation of what someone's going to do. And I think that that does count for, for quite a lot. So I think um, they've got to be at least, you know, if, if we say the 22, like the 18 and the four reserves, you, they've got to be, I, I, I would hope in that in that 22 at least, and then knocking on the door for the full squad. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you. Th I was going to say massive thanks. Uh, I always say massive thanks, uh, Mary Claire, for coming on. And hopefully... You know, your podcast will start this week or the ne next week. And, um, you know, people, not just north of the border, south of the border, because you know, football is football. Yeah. And we like watching football wherever it's played. You know, there's so many people watching the American football. Uh, I'll call it American football because they, they stole our name. It is football. Um, you know, the uh, US leagues are starting up now. Um, and people watch that. So, you know, why, should, why shouldn't they be watching you know, the, um, Scottish football, Welsh football, Northern Ireland? Irish football as well, as well as the uh, Super League and, and English football down here. So, good luck with that. I'm sure with the uh, with your passion, you're going to make a success uh, a success of it. Thanks very much for taking me on. It's a, probably a big job for yourselves. <laughs> uh, hopefully, my uh, my accent. I was trying to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> I get oh. very passionate about football and I talk very fast. So, thank you very much for having me on your show. And all the best, very best to you both as well. Thank no. you. No worry, Mary Claire. I've lived in Liverpool for a few years, so trust me, you get used to <laughs> uh, <laughs> difficult accents for, for us. So, thanks a lot, Mary Claire. You take care, and we'll hopefully you see too. you soon. Let's bring uh, Carly. That's on. Let's just have a quick look. See, we've got a, a question. Uh, oh, well, Mary, sorry, Craig, I missed your question. Mary Claire's gone, but he was asking how is Scotland adjusted to all their best players heading south. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't see the question. I was too engrossed in uh, what Mary Claire was saying. What I'm going to do? We've got. Uh, um, we should have somebody else coming on, but in the meantime, I've got to pull up a question for you. Uh, who am I going to pull it up from? Let's pull it up. I've got three questions that people have submitted, so let's pull up this one. Hi, Ian Shiverton here, Portsmouth Women fan. Uh, my question is, do you think it's fair that the official Women's FA Cup Twitter account only counts goals from the first round proper onwards when it displays its top goal scoring charts? Surely this is disrespectful to those players who play in the preliminary rounds. Well, there's a, there's a question. So, did you get that, Carly? Yeah, I think I, my, I don't think my internet's doing me great wonders, so you'll have to repeat it for me. Sorry. Yeah, don't worry. We'll go. We'll, we'll go for it. Look, it's, it's it's technology. Obviously, if people want to hear what you're going to say, they, they'll fight through the technology. So, uh, I think the question was basically: Is it disrespectful to the women uh, footballers who played in the pre preliminary rounds of the FA Cup for them for their goals not to be included? in the goal tables that the uh, FA put out. Because I think there was something on Twitter um, yesterday or the day before where they put the top goal scorers um, and they'd only included people from the first two rounds. And uh, you know, people feel that's disrespectful and not taking into any, any recognition for what people uh, players have done in the preliminary round. So what do you think? Yeah, no, um, I, I, I think it is a little, actually. I think, you know, if you work hard to score goals in the preliminary rounds, you should be you should be kind of um, 
you should be no you should be noted for that you know that's that's hard work it's not easy you know you've you've worked hard to, to finish I mean you should be recognized for that so I, I do think it's a little bit and, and also I think I think it also helps bring more awareness to everything that's going on around in terms of you know the the teams that are slightly smaller or, or lower down um and, and they've taken part of it exactly the same as anyone else um within the, the those top two the last two rounds so I think that's that it should only be fair that they're also shown on there as well yeah I mean I've never understood it personally why do you have to call it a preliminary round why can't the first round be round one I I, I know you might end up with round 12 and at, at, right at the end or I know in the men's game you probably end up at round 20 and and you know when you talk about the top goal scorers part of me can understand why you don't want them because you know you've got somebody who scored if I remember correctly the top scorer after round two had eight goals now, it might just be the big names when the big teams come in. No one's going to get anywhere near eight goals in, let's say, the five games that the big teams play. And, you know, you might end up with none of the big names on the charts. And I say, so what? You know, it's every round is a round of the FA Cup. So, you know, it is a little bit disrespectful. I mean, would you like to see it change? And the, and the first prelim round is round one. Yeah. No, I, I, would, I would like to see it change. Um, look, I, I get there can be a variation in teams that play each other in the Bruno, in the preliminary rounds. I understand that, but um, at the end of the day, you should still be, you know, you should still be glorified for the good work that you do. Um, and I think it also, I think it just sends a message of protection for those teams that are at the top tiers, um, you know, of of the football pyramid, and and not for the teams that are lower down there. If that makes sense, you know, I think it's, I think it's only right that they they share the same platform so to speak um as the people in the top tiers as well because we're trying to make the game um a more all-rounded game for everybody to to be able to take part in and, and want to go on and push and and i think that's only right that that should happen yeah just waiting for uh, a couple more people who uh, we had uh, one person in the waiting room and he's disappeared i think he's lost maybe lost the connection just going to see uh, so, so, uh, just looking to see if we get anybody else uh, coming in. Have a quick look. Uh, I've got a couple more questions which I might just go to them on video. So these have been submitted um, a few minutes ago on video. So let's follow up Josh's question. Hi, it's Josh here. And my question is for you today Do you think that Northern Ireland can get the job finished? against Ukraine on Tuesday night and qualify for next summer's Euro 2022 tournament? Well, I'm going to grab this one because uh, uh, I don't know how much Northern Irish football you watch, Carly. Do you, you get a chance to watch I'll, much? I'll see you here. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take this one because um, you know, I've been uh, quite involved uh, recently on uh, Northern Ireland football because uh, I've been at the press conferences for some of the players and the manager, Kenny Shields, I've watched the game on Friday. I, I remember saying it was such an excited game because there's so much at stake for Northern Ireland. They ranked 49th in the world. They were playing against Ukraine, who are, I think, 24th or 25th in the world uh, in a playoff for the U uh, European Championships next uh, summer. Um, and they, look, look, they are underdogs. Uh, they say they are. You look at the disparity in, uh, in the positions in, in, in the rankings, um, but they show a tenacity and resilience and quality every time they take uh, to the field. Kenny Shields, that I spoke to him last week, is a he's a character, but he's always shooting for the stars. He's always shooting for the, for the stars. He's always positive. And he said, we're going to go to Ukraine. We're going out there to win the game. Then we're going to come back and we're going out there to win the game. Whatever happens in Ukraine, we want to win the game. So this positive attitude, and you can see it, you know, uh, getting into the players when you hear the players at press conferences, they're so positive as well. The, the belief in the squad and the team is there. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. I was talking to uh, Laura Rafferty today. I mean, she's uh, a Bristol City player who's been out injured for a long time. She came on a, a sub on, on Friday and she was so positive. Um, you know, that, that mentality is there in that squad. And, and as I said, they're not looking to, you know, they won 2 1 over in Ukraine. They've got the, those away goals, but they're not looking to try and hang on and hold on 
and, and, and get through for what they did in the Ukraine. They want to get through for what they're going to do in Northern Ireland back, back home. It's a little bit harder for them because they've had to make that trip. I think they went out on Thursday to the Ukraine um, and then they've had to come back. They've had to come back to Northern Ireland. Ukraine have only made one trip. So that, you know, Ukraine strip is now from there to here, whereas Northern Ireland have done that extra bit of travel. And it, it takes a little bit out of you, uh, that, that extra bit of travel. And they've not had much training because of COVID, um, very little training whatsoever, uh, if truth be told. So for what they've done, it's it's an amazing achievement for what they've done. Um, they, they suffered uh, with an injury uh, on, on Friday. Um, so hopefully, you know, the full squad that was available for that game on Friday will be available um, on Tuesday night. We'll find out, I think, tomorrow uh, at the extent of the injuries. Uh, but why can't they get through? I mean, you know, as I said, they've, they've gone out to Ukraine. They've won 2-1 two, two, over there. Ukraine have to score a minimum of two goals. Um, and I think what we saw from uh, Northern Ireland over there on Friday night, that they're more than uh, capable of scoring a goal or two themselves and creating chances uh, and putting the pressure back on the Ukraine. You know, I think if they can score that first goal, it, I think that that belief and that momentum and that, uh, that mentality will uh, push them over the line. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, reasonably confident. I don't. I, I never like to be too confident in case you get let down. But you know, it's in their hands. You know, no one can take it away from them. And Ukraine are going to have to put up, you know, an amazing performance to um, beat the girls from Northern Ireland. So, you know, I'll say fingers crossed to them and hope they can get through. Just have a look at any comments. Craig says he's done more than Ludlow and Kerr did with Wales and Scotland. Gets the best out of what he has. Um, that's Craig's comment there when we're talking about Scotland. So we haven't got any more guests waiting. So if you, you do want to get in touch, you can do that. We sh should still have... We've got one more. We've got Jack uh, who sent us a video just to... A little while ago, uh, earlier on today, so I'll, I'll bring Jack's um, video up, a video question, and I'll let you so have a go at that. Can I support the lionesses and FC Bayern Munich? Um, so in midweek, I'm sure most people have seen the big storm that's been caused up, really, uh, circulating around Maria Isabel, the Real Madrid goalkeeper. Uh, and the abuse she got under a tweet where she posted a photo of her and Marcos Asensio side by side doing a celebration with a shirt showing the passion for Real Madrid. Um, so my question really is what can be done to avoid this kind of abuse in the future on Twitter? Um, and how, how can we tackle it really? Because it's every every week now. Someone posts it on Twitter and you know, a little keyboard of our reason grief typing unnecessary things. Well, I'll, I'll you know kind of uh, make it quite a little bit broader, Carly, before you, you get into answer that. We've look, it's it's gone on for a long time. Abuse uh, on on Twitter, for, or, or other social media for various different things, whether it's sexist misogyny, whether it's uh, um, homophobic abuse, it's racist abuse, all sorts of bigotry and xenophobia, um, and. It, it seems to have snowballed recently because people have, have been called out for it. You know, we, we're having players coming out and um, calling out, I can't call them fans, uh, people who've sent the messages usually on Instagram or, or on Twitter, disgusting um, uh, messages at times and, and all sorts of vile abuse. And so they've been called out and, and they've got this kind of, sometimes you feel a bit of not, notoriety, a bit of infamy. And that's uh, egged on some other idiots to join in and do the same because they can see that, um, you know, that, um, that, that, as I said, the notoriety. And so what do you, I mean, first of all, I mean, you, you want to comment on what it, what it's all about and, and what do you think could or should be done about it? Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's extremely disappointing that people are still kind of um, doing these things in the time that we live in now uh, um, isn't it? it's something that for some re reason a, a small a very small group of people who, who think they know or, or watch the game um, feel like their opinion abusing anyone over social media or, or anything like that is 
is a, is a good thing to do, and, and it's frustrating. Look, I've I've suffered abuse myself um, when I played, so I can understand and relate to to kind of everyone that has, has had to deal with that and, and go through that. And it's something that needs to needs to stop. Um, I do think the, the the media companies need to do more um, in terms of helping and protecting the people that are on their platforms, um, because like I said, no player should have to to go onto their social media after a game and and read all the the um, the abuse and negativity that they get. Look, you can have a, you can have an opinion and you can criticise, um, and I think most players will accept that. They know what they're in the game for, and they know that will come as part of the game. But um, when we talk about certain things that are said when it comes to to the women's game and and things like that, it's it's nowhere near acceptable, and and it, and it needs to it needs to be stopped. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know uh, Judy's still in the background, and you can nod your head if you want to join in, Jude, or shake it if you don't. Would you like to join in? You want to join in? Jude want Jude want to make a comment. I'll bring yeah, Jude in. to join in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what's what's your? Uh, I'll just put you on mute for a little while, Carly. What, uh, Carly? What's your what's your opinion, uh, Jude? I, I think it's disgusting. Um, I, I'll be honest. I hadn't seen the one about Real Madrid, so I I, I can't comment on that. Um, but I know that, um, let me make sure I pronounce her name correctly. Is it Rinsola Babajadi, um, Liverpool player? Yeah. She, she was called out in the week. She's, she's received a lot of, um, racist abuse, um, online as well. And, you know, it's, it's disgusting, you know, in it's 2021, um, it's, it's just not acceptable. It's like you were saying, Ray, I mean, whether you're, you know, whether it's racist, sexist, homophobic misogynistic you know it's it's just not acceptable and and i agree with with, with carly i mean the um the social media companies need to be doing more as well a, around this as well um sadly it, i i just don't think it will ever go away um which which is it, it upsets me I mean, I'm, I'm i'm gay myself so you know i've i've had um, abuse before um, and and it's it's horrible um, you know you've got people that are basically you know what we've got to remember is most of these people are professional athletes so they're going and doing their job they're going out to do the job and they're just getting abuse for it you know it's it's disgusting you know it's not acceptable in the workplace you know whether it's you or you or I going off to do our job it's not acceptable there you know we're protected um in most workplaces you've got protection around you know discrimination um it, it needs to be better in, in within the social media companies as well yeah i mean like you said Jude, if, if people did this in 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 a job they'd be up for disciplinary or dismissal if they, they behave in sport like they do if they did it in the street there are repercussions and they do it uh, hiding behind the cloak of anonymity on social media uh, they think that's that's a get out, and you know, obviously, we, I, I never, we don't know where where people are who are who are actually making these comments. Whether you know, it's in a investment in in the states, in the UK, Russia. We have no idea where these people are because it's they're they're basically anonymous on, on social media. And look, I mean, people know me. People know I've taken a, a fair bit of abuse over the years on social on social media, and, and I've always said. Um, one of the issues is we don't take control of it ourselves enough. When we see people throwing out abuse and there are friends on social media, far too many people don't say anything. And, and in fact, and some of the people who've uh, I've seen abuse, and other people join in, and they still. And it's like they either egg them on or like an abusive post. I'll say nothing, and I, and I think if you're saying nothing, you're give, you're actually empowering the, those abusive people. If they're your friend in real life or, or online, and you say nothing when you see some uh, uh, some vile abuse, then you're empowering them. You're uh, you're enabling them. You're allowing them to get away with that. And and, and generally, if I see any sort of abuse, that person's uh, reported and blocked. You know, and, and Trust me, if, if they're my friend, they're reported and blocked. That, that's how it works. You cannot, you know, some people are will try and discuss 
uh, with them, um, you know, what their views are and say that, that it's unacceptable. And if I feel there's no um, sensible uh, discussion, then they just revolt and block. And I think, you know, that's the only way it, it is. And there's something that happened a few years ago, and, and it causes a problem. There's a, a channel, um, a YouTube channel, and one of the hosts there, the team, I mean, this is usually the way it is. The team lost stream of abuse. It was homophobic abuse, um, and it was disgusting. Um, and I think they tried to semi-downplay it, but if I remember correctly, at the end of the year, in their top five videos of the year, that was in the list of their top five videos. That's what, you know, in their, uh, they were gloating about it, glorifying it even. So I don't know whether they'd made an apology or not. But then you see that very same panel interviewing players a few years later and managers. Now, I've not seen what's gone on in an intervening period where there's someone apologised because it was, it was a terrible terrain of vile abuse. That's uncalled for in this day and age. You know, things have changed. You know, when, when I was a kid, the jokes we would make then are not acceptable now. And, and times change and we as a society have to change along with that and accept that, hang on, what people were saying 40 years ago, what you might have seen on TV, your mind, your languages and your, and some of the other programmes. We can't behave like that, like these caricatures and stereotypes. We can't do it. But I think the game itself has to stand back and look at some of the people they allow um, their players, managers on the club to be involved with just because, for example, they're a big, they've become a big media, of, um, some of them organisations where they've got maybe 10 employees, so they're not small uh, and they should have proper standards. So if, if, if a team is allowing their players or the manager to interact with that, um, let, I'll call it a, for a, a, a YouTube channel, let's call it that way, um, then they're perpetuating, perpetuating the, the problem. They're not so helping to solve it. And I, I just think you have to cut off, sometimes you have to cut, you know, cut off the, the air, the oxygen to the, these people and organisations. And it's not and it's not just, you know, the wider society, societal problem. But you've got to say, if it's your friend doing or saying something, it might be, depends how bad they go to start with, but have a word. Try and make them understand what they're doing is wrong. And if there's no uh, remorse, no sincerity, no, you know, then just step away. And, and until we do that, this is just going to carry on. And we we'll see it again and again around um, various projects, whether it's uh, to, to do with uh, racism or, you know, when clubs are supporting um, uh, anti-racism campaigns, kick it out and stuff like that. When you've got the rainbow laces, um, uh, you know, when they're supporting that, and fan, so-called fans are coming online and criticising. I've always said, if you've got, if you've not got anything good to say, expect not to say anything at all. You know, don't show everybody what a, a fool you are. So I, I don't know if you guys want to want to come back on that, Carly, at all, and, and add anything to that. No, I think I I agree with you wholeheartedly there. What you said, I think I think one of the biggest steps that we need to make is calling out the people who might be close to us who say these things or do these things um because i think once you hold them accountable they'll think about it they'll think about ever doing it again that's for sure um and i think sometimes we you know we we fail to recognize that you know that there is times when you need to step in and, and say something to someone who may be close to you because what they're doing is is wrong and also what they're doing is hurtful for others um i'd like to think you know most people know right from wrong and feeling like you can send any kind of, of abuse to someone because you're hiding behind a, a screen and, and typing on a keyboard um, is awful and, and it's something that I you know I would like to see rid of as quick as possible but I think you're right I think it's you know it's not just in sport it's it's a societal problem um, but it seems that sport is the place where you can kind of do that and get away with it um, and I think it's what needs to change yeah. Do you want to come back with the final uh, word on this, Jude? Yeah, I think for, for me, prejudice is taught. You know, we're not we're not born with any kind of prejudice. You know, we're not born homophobic. We're not born racist. That that's taught, um, and and more needs to be done. Um, you know, 
kids look up to people whether it's parents teachers you know any kind of like whether it's a sports club or, or mental you know people look up to people and they will learn prejudice from there um you know we only have to look at i can't remember which footballer it was but it was he was getting all the racist abuse and it turns out there were like 11 12 year old kids in the west midland yeah. doing this Ian right i think you know, right some from kids took some right. abuse from kids Ian right and as well as others have yeah so you know, we we need to, you know, we need we need to be getting this drummed in at, at schools, and I think it's I think it's getting a lot better from knowing people who who are teachers, and that you know, there's more happening in schools. But you know, and I'm sort of picking up on, you know, the the older generation, you know, just because, like you're saying, just because it was acceptable in the 1970s for sort of racist um, sitcoms on the telly, you know, that that. It wasn't right then, and it's definitely still not right now, you know. So it's and and just because somebody's of an older generation, um, look at the the guy who was uh, resigned from the FA, Clark Clark, wasn't it? Clark, um, yeah. You know, just that that's not an excuse. You know, you have to move with the times. You have to, you know, that you can't say that. You know, you, you have you just have to move with the times, and um, you know, just accept that what you're saying is just. It's not okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Jude. Thanks for coming on and having a, a chat with us about that. Good evening. Take care. Yep. See you soon, guys. Let's pop it right. Uh, I'm going to say a massive thanks um, to Carly. I'm going to pop him, his uh, mic back on. Massive thanks for coming on tonight, Carly. I know. Look, I, I, personally, I think I did you a favour because I know you're an Arsenal fan, and I knew you really didn't want to watch. They're gonna be uh, playing tonight. I mean, they've, they've been uh, they've been horrible. So I thought, you know, I'll I'll, I'll run it at a time where you, you might miss some of the game. Uh, and if you if you're doing well or you're winning, then you can watch the second half. But uh, no, it, it, it's yeah. great to get. <laughs> it's it's always good to get someone from you know, manager or coach from, from inside the women's game to come on and, and talk and give your opinion uh, and, and get your your point across as well. So. Hopefully we'll have you on, on some shows, you know, where next season when we uh, ra hopefully ramp up our game and have lots of um, shows to do with the Women's National League and grassroots football. Brilliant. Thank you for having me on. It's been it's been fantastic. I really appreciate that. Cheers, mate. You take care. Have a good evening. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. There you have it, guys. Uh, another show done. Uh, an hour more than an hour has flown by. Thanks uh, for all the guests who've uh, come on and asked questions. Thanks for Carly uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, we'll be here, similar sort of time, I suspect, next week. Uh, it'd be great if you can join us. And if you want to ask questions, just follow us on Twitter and uh, you you know get involved during the day. And uh, we, we, you know, if, you, if you're not available to come on live, if, you, if you're a bit worried about that, you can send a video question in. And if you don't want to appear on screen, you can uh, do an audio question as well. You can come on live, ask an audio question, or you can submit an audio question. We're trying to be as uh, uh, inclusive as possible and to give you many different ways to get your points and questions across to us. Thanks once again uh, to everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next week.